Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. joy it is to be together and hear this familiar story. It's one of those stories that um, it's kind of like whether or not you grew up in the Christian tradition, most people kind of know this story. I I brought a friend recently to an event where we talked about this story and my friend did not grow up in the church at all and said to me, oh, I know this one. Like it was like a a hit. Like the story of the, the Jesus guy, I know this one. It is a story that is familiar and sometimes because it's familiar, we forget how sacred it is. We have been on a series where we've been talking about sort of the adventurous life. That was me. I came up with that and I was really excited about it. You guys don't look as impressed as I was when I came up with adventurous. Adventurous life. The life of Advent. Advent, the season of waiting, the four weeks before Christmas. We started off by talking about hope. We talked about love joy and peace. And last week, I I shared a familiar story, one that I thought I knew really well, one that I thought like I could just share it with people. And last week, by last week, I mean yesterday. Friends, it feels like an entire week since yesterday. But yesterday, as I went to share this story about peace, I started to cry in the middle of preaching, which I'm Canadian and we're not allowed to do that. But I did. I just got really like caught up like this with this feeling in my throat. And it was for a couple of reasons. But one of the reasons was when I looked up to sort of compose myself, I noticed these chandeliers. And as I was telling the story, I was reminded that the story that I was telling took place in the church I grew up in at a funeral for one of my favorite neighbors when I was nine years old. And for some reason, looking at what's ordinary and something I look at all the time touched me. It was almost like I was transported back to being nine-year-old Sarah who was scared and didn't know what peace looked like. And then I also thought about Christmas Eve. See, our family, I know this is going to be hard to imagine, those of you who have kids, but it was really hard for us to get to church, especially on time. And so we were balcony people. We were always like in the balcony. And my parents, if they weren't in choir, we were like hiding up in the balcony. And I remember Christmas Eve, I used to love it because we would sit in the balcony and the lights were so close And I remember just thinking how beautiful this place was. And I remember every year we would hear the same story, the story of Jesus' birth. And it was ordinary, and yet there was something magical and sacred about it. The story that we have of Jesus' birth is filled with what I call sacred ordinary. What makes it so sacred is that it's an ordinary story that we keep coming back to again and again. Even if this is one of the only times that we come to church, there's something about this story. Like if I were to come up and like come up with a totally new thing I wanted to talk to you guys about on Christmas Eve, you'd be like, what is happening, right? You come to hear the story of Christ's child birth. And we get that story from Matthew and Luke two scripture or two uh, chapters that teach us a lot about this story of Jesus, but it mentions particular things, particular ordinary things. For instance, that Jesus' mother was Mary. Mary, a common name. There were lots of good Jewish girls named Mary. But Mary is not ordinary. Mary is probably around 13, which was childbearing years. Remember, 30 was like the life expectancy, I'm ancient. And so for her to be 13 years old and an angel to appear and for her reaction to be, huh, like she's troubled, but she still hears what he has to say. And after hearing that, she, what I love is she's like a good Jewish girl. She just keeps asking him questions like, that's interesting, but what about this, right? If an angel showed up in my house... I think I would just be like, all right, perfect, Um, whatever you say. But instead, she's questioning this story. How can this be for I am just ordinary? Mary, a common name. And then Jesus, Yeshua, is a very common name in the Middle East. And actually a very common name here. I was sharing uh, last service. I was wearing a cross recently in Target, and the checkout guy was like, 
Jesus and pointed at me. And I forgot I was wearing a cross. So I was like, what did I do, right? Like when someone yells Jesus at you, you have assumed you've done something. So I was like, oh. And then he goes, Jesus, and points at my cross and I noticed it. And he points to his name tag and says, Jesus. A common name. And we laughed. There is something sacred about the ordinariness of this, that God would be so risky that to this story, this, this odd idea of, of this love that is so different and yet so ordinary. There is something that warms us as we hear this story, but when we do that, we kind of miss out on the scandal of the story because Mary comes from a long line of people who were oppressed So for her to be the one who will have a child that will be the one that will have a kingdom upon his shoulder, and then the Jesus, it's almost like we're getting a little foretaste of how he won't be what everyone thinks because he's just going to be ordinary but sacred. I think about our own lives and how the most profound moments are usually those sacred, ordinary moments. This morning I did the same thing I do every Christmas Eve Eve, and I take my dog, and it's the one time a year I embarrass him and I make him wear an outfit. And so he wore, I bought an a, a elf outfit for him, which I had at a party the other night, and I put him in my elf outfit, and we went to the beach, which is his favorite place on earth. And he was running in circles as an elf, and you can imagine how cute everyone thought he was. The, this man kind of walked up to me and he and I got in this long conversation about our dogs at first and then for some reason and I still don't quite know why he asked me sort of like oh where where do you work and and it's always odd as a pastor especially one who doesn't necessarily look like a pastor to explain like what I do and and so I said well I'm I'm a pastor and um I'm a pastor of that church he's like oh I know that church I thought it was closed for a while it's like no 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 we're still going um we have been growing this year and it's it was a great conversation and there was something about our conversation I could tell he was ready to share with me and he said you know I used to be a youth pastor in my catholic church I I had done youth for years and years and years I said, oh, what happened? He said, well, when I was around 40, it was like a random Tuesday, and I was driving home, and I really, like, loved Jesus, and then I was driving home, and one day I was in my driveway, and I went, nope, none of it's real. And he said, all of a sudden, it was this weird feeling inside of me, and I started to laugh, which some of you may not know, but our congregation is filled with people who had that exact same moment. And part of what God has called me towards is to journey and sit with people who go, I don't know about this thing. And so in this moment, I'm like, oh, here we go again, God. And so this guy and I have this long conversation. He shares with me that he's come back to the faith, but he came back to the faith because he was watching a science show and he was watching a physicist talk about what's ordinary to him and a theologian have a conversation about how weird the world is. And all of a sudden he said he felt it again. And he said, oh. I may not believe the way I used to believe, but there's something, and it's big, and it's grand. And he said, it's funny, I came to my faith again through science, which was funny to me because I have a friend who, that's his story. And so we, we exchanged numbers, and as he was walking away, he, he yelled back, hey, I'm praying for you. I was like, thank you. And the whole beach like, stared at me with this like, weird dog, and they probably were thinking, like, you should pray for her, she's crazy. Um, but it was this profound moment, but it was ordinary. And it was sacred. You know, sometimes because of Instagram or Facebook, we think our lives should be filled with adventure, right? Like, I think all of my friends run half marathons every weekend, right? Because if I just look at their Instagrams or all of them are out in LA and I'm like, why isn't anyone inviting me? I mean, there's just, you look at it and you think, life is filled with adventure, what am I doing? But we know that that's not always the case. It's a curated story we're often showing. And I think because of that, we miss out on the sacredness of the ordinary. Those moments, those profound moments that we're, we're sort of being hinted at because we're always trying to outdo. You know, I had a friend in, in seminary and grad school. We always had to tell our call story. So the story of how we went into ministry. Like over and over again, we'd have to write it. I think they made us do that because they wanted us to like remember so we didn't quit. So we like constantly were telling our story. And my dear friend, he like got tired of it. He's like, I don't even think they read it. So he wrote one that was like more... Like he was on the streets of LA and he like sold drugs, which is only funny because he's from North Dakota and he lived quite a normal 
life. But he looked at me and he said, I need a testimony that's better than I'm a farm boy from North Dakota who's always loved Jesus. And so he created this entire other character because for some reason we feel like that which is profound means more. That's not the case, is it? Every year we come to hear an ordinary story that's sacred. As I was leaving the beach this morning, I noticed something that I notice all the time driving around, um, and it's because I used to run track, and so I have PTSD. When I see teams running, I think, oh shoot, I've missed it, right? And so I saw this team of people running, and then I saw a girl running, and she kept turning around and running and smiling, which creeps me out why she's smiling. So I'm thinking, what is, why is she smiling at when she's running? She's clearly running, she's gotta be in pain, but she was smiling, and then I realized she was running with her special needs brother. And there it was again, the ordinary that was sacred. Every year we come to this story. And whether we're ready to understand what it means at all or or whether we've rejected it totally, there's something profound about even the idea that for thousands of years we've been telling the same story. In the same way, in just a moment, we're going to take a meal together. And that meal is one where all of you are invited. That is part of what our church believes is that everyone is welcome to come to this meal together. We're going to do something called intinction. And I'm explaining this because it didn't last service and it was hysterical. But um, we will give you a wafer which you are to dip into the grape juice, which we will call wine. Um, and then you take communion. All are welcome. So much so that, in fact, our, uh, what we offer is dairy-free, gluten-free, soy-free, nut-free. It's all the frees. Um, we try really hard. We have several folks in our community who have allergies, and we want to take communion with them. And so we're intentional about what we um, serve. But the profoundness of that meal, even, was that it was ordinary and yet sacred. Friends, my prayer for you is that as we enter into these last couple of hours of Christmas Eve, you would start noticing the sacred ordinary moments and that they would touch you deeply and that you would remember the manger and this lowly child, Mary's kid, who is going to grow into this profound leader that none of us can seem to get over. It is a beautiful story. Before we take uh, communion, I would love for us to just take a time to sort of confess and set ourselves right with not just, you know, each other and ourselves, but just to prepare ourselves for the meal. So the words will be up on the screen. Merciful God, we confess that often we find darkness more comfortable than light. We confess that we find your good news frightening and unsettling, especially when we consider its demands as well as its promises. We confess that Christmas has become more to us than the birthday of the Christ, partly because we do not want a Christ child in our lives or in our world. Forgive us, break us, bend us, remake us. Give us the courage to lay ourselves open to the wonder and healing of your coming. Be born again into our world. Be born again into our hearts and lives. Hear now our silent and personal confessions as we prepare ourselves for your nativity. The true light that enlightened us all has come into the world. If we'll just take a moment to center ourselves, however that is comfortable for you, and offer whatever it is you want to offer. The light that shines on in the darkness, and the darkness has never been able to put it out. Let's read this together. This is the good news. God has heard our confession. God has forgiven our sin. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in the words of the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth, you created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. 
but we turned away and our love failed. Your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets in the fullness of time. You gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior and at his birth, the angels sang, glory to you in the highest and peace to your people on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of the ordinary stable, Jesus was born. So by the baptism of a suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. As your word became flesh born of a woman that night long, long ago, so in that night in which he gave himself, he had an ordinary meal in which he took bread, broke the bed, and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, in the same way he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim this, the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, God Almighty, Father, now and forever. Amen.